Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce Freedom Dom Lau. He's a lead technologist for Zephyr, and they are also a sponsor for um, the, this event, so we'd like to thank them for that. So I'll leave the uh, space so that they can start talking about the presentation. Thanks. Am I on? Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to building an army of data collecting robots in Python. Uh, if you thought this was a talk about robotics, I apologize. I won't actually be talking about any real uh, physical robots. This is the, the web crawling, scraping uh, kind. So let everyone uh, settle in a little bit here. So my name is Freedom Doomlau. Uh, I am not famous, but thanks to Mel Gibson, my name is famous. And I also get to see this picture emailed to me or Skyped or texted like once a week. Thanks, Sorry. thanks, <laughs> Mel Gibson and all of my coworkers. Uh, if you've seen me online, you probably saw me referenced as API Guy. Uh, you'll find me as API Guy on Twitter, uh, GitHub, Bitbucket. Uh, I don't have a GitHub repository for this talk, and I'll explain why that is a little bit later on. Uh, I used to do a lot of work that was solely API-based, and I, I kept that name because it kind of rhymes. Uh, so I work for a company called Zephyr, and Zephyr is the uh, leading SaaS platform for brands, uh, media, and uh, rights management on YouTube. And I've also done a little bit of side projects. Uh, if any of you guys do web development and you've heard of the framework Flask, uh, I'm the creator of the Flask extension called Flask Classy, which gives you class-based views for your Flask applications. And I love talking about it, uh, both all the merits and problems. So if you want to talk about that, uh, talk to me later on. So originally, I was doing a different talk. I don't know if you guys were looking through the, uh, the talk descriptions earlier on. Uh, originally, I was going to do a talk called OPD, Yeah, You Know Me. Uh, that's a Naughty by Nature reference for anybody who didn't exist in the 1990s. And the idea of this talk was aggregating all of the data that people tend to make available publicly about themselves and using that to game some social media uh, sites. And it turns out, you know, social media sites aren't that big on having people figure out ways to game them. And they sent me you know, a couple of nice letters. And I was like, yeah, I'm a cool guy. I'll just scrap the talk I've been working on for three weeks and write a whole new one in uh, three days. So uh, if I skip a slide or if there's an extra, extra slide, I apologize. It's, I've been cramming on this for the last few days. Uh, so why this talk? So I am not a data scientist, right? I am an enterprise software architect, which means I take small programs and I build big programs that run on a lot of different computers. And an easier way to say that is I take something that's really simple and I make it way more complicated. <laughs> and I have a lot of friends, though. Uh, I, I live in Boston, Massachusetts. There's a large data science community there. Uh, and I have a lot of friends that are in data science. And a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a friend of mine uh, named Linda. We were having lunch, and she's a human behavioral researcher, uh, and she had this side project she was working on where she wanted, as part of the side project, to build up a database of shareable content, things that people might be able to share on social media. And that was the core of it. And she told me she was having a lot of trouble because it was taking so long. See, she set up this system where she could go to a website and then copy the link, and then paste it into a CSV file that she was building. And it just took forever, like one person manually copying these things in. Now, this is a person who actually does know Python. She spent some time building scripts, and she thought about automating it. But to her, it just seemed easier. Let's just, let's just do this copy and paste thing. Uh, but after a couple of weeks, she only had a few hundred URLs uh, put together with some extra data that she'd collected about them. And I talked to her, like, why are you doing this? I was really surprised because. Linda is way smarter than me. I couldn't imagine why she would be doing so much manual work. And she didn't realize that while she was out there, she's getting her information from the internet. She didn't realize that she could actually be using the internet to do the work of getting the information for her. 
So I just found the clicker, so I don't have to walk back and forth as much. Um, so before we dive into what, uh, what Linda and I built that afternoon, uh, let's just talk a little bit about what data on the web looks like. I think you guys are mostly going to be familiar with this stuff. So the obvious one is HTML, right? This is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. You've probably seen some JSON APIs where you can get this data. It's nicely structured and easy to parse. Python handles this extremely well. Uh, if you take a time machine back like 10 years, you'll probably be stuck working with a lot of this stuff. Or if you're working with the AdWords API. Anybody from Google here? So, um, so this is what the, the most of the data is that we think about on, on the internet. But there's a lot of other data, right? There's images, there's videos, there's source code, the programs, there's data sets, like actual data sets you can just download and start using, um, audio data. There's data about the activity on the internet, like how long did it take me to get a response back from a server, how many network hops did I have to get there. And then, of course, there is metadata, which is everyone's favorite now, right? This is the, the talk of the day. But I'm not talking about this particular <laughs> metadata, just so you know. Uh, metadata is it's data about your data. And we've been doing this for a long time, right? HTML 1.0 has a tag called meta that's used to describe the data in the page that we kind of used early on because we wanted to force Yahoo to think that our web page was the best web page. So you just copy that keyword like a thousand times. Um, but metadata has grown quite a bit, and we, we've come to appreciate it more. And there's this really cool protocol called the Open Graph Protocol, which I believe was born uh, here at Facebook. The Open Graph Protocol lets you uh, describe the content so that it can be used as a social uh, media shareable item really easily. So if she wanted to find and build uh, data and build a database of searchable, shareable items, Open Graph is the stuff that she should have been looking for right away. She didn't know about this, so this is where we started. So this is what Open Graph looks like. Uh, this is a really simple one, but it's just using the, the classic HTML meta tags with these properties with the special OG type. There's a few required ones, and then there are dozens of optional ones that you can use. But this is the reason why when you share something on Facebook, it doesn't just look like a link. It ends up looking like a nice little formatted box with, it, with a title and description and maybe a playable uh, video player in there. So Linda and I sat down that afternoon, right after lunch, and we started building our very first robot. And we wanted to keep it really simple. So we wanted to do these four things. We wanted to be able to read a list of URLs that we would pass in, download the HTML from each of those URLs, find any Open Graph data that might be in there. Believe it or not, not everybody is, is using Open Graph right now. And then just print that back out. So this is a pretty simple uh, system. This is how we wanted to be able to use it, right? Just pass in a bunch of URLs. Those social media company names look familiar. So this is our very first robot. Now, before I go any farther, I'm not going to be doing a lot of showing code in this presentation. I assume a lot of you guys have seen Python code. And if I talk about it, you'll probably be able to conceptually realize how you would put something together. Uh, but this is a starting point, And a couple of times, I'll reference this code later on as we go. This is really basic. We're using the Open Graph library to, to strip the Open Graph data out. It gives us a, a dictionary-like object that we can work with later on. So this is our first robot. And this is our initial system architecture. So we have a user who puts a bunch of URLs into our robot, and it dumps it out onto this console. And Linda was super psyched about this when she saw this going, because she took that list of URLs that she had been collecting and passed it right in and got back out this nice uh, formatted parsable data set. And it just like buzzed right along the screen. She was so psyched. And I said, did you remember all of that? And she said, no, of course not, because it's all on the screen and the buffer ran out. So we need a way to save the output of this script, right? We can't just look at it and remember it when we go to run our next program. So this is the first problem you have to solve. You have to save it. So I asked Linda, I said, how are we going to save what just came out of your script? And she said, easy. Uh, we can just write this to a file, right? No big deal. She just added the little caret operator and the name of a file she wanted to. It all dumped into a file. 
and we were good. So I lied a little bit earlier. I didn't actually let her run her entire file uh, before. I let her just run some of it, and we control seed and, and quit as it was running. So once we had this, she actually started running the whole thing. And then she started thinking, like, OK, well, I want to add this URL. I want to add this URL. But this first robot wasn't done running yet, right? And we didn't want to stop it. So she just wanted to run another robot. And another robot, as she was thinking of more URLs, she could add them in and pointing them all at this file. Now, does anybody here see a problem with this particular system architecture? The file was crap. Like, there was, this was completely unusable. Uh, she didn't expect that to happen. She thought, you know, it's a computer. It's going to take care of this. Uh, and it, it does take care of it. You just don't get anything useful in the end. So she was a little baffled. And I said, how would you solve this problem? And her first response was, the, she said, well, what if we use XML? <laughs> XML is not a, a database. So we talked a little bit through it, and she came up with this. She'll dump it out, each process, to a different file. And then when she's done, she can gather them all up together, write maybe another Python script to just mash them all together and concatenate them. And then she can load that data into her tool of choice. By the way, this is probably the only talk that you guys are going to see where you're not going to see anybody presenting like Pandas or Scikit-learn or any of those tools. Uh, I am. She uses pandas. I'm aware of pandas. Um, so the first problem with this solution is that we have multiple files. We don't know how many there are going to be. Um, and we have to figure out a way to put all that data together. The second problem is I can't start reading this data until all of these little robots are done, right? I can't just start picking up files that are half written, I don't know if I'm going to get good data. I'll probably break whatever it is I'm using to parse that up. And the next problem is, what if I'm getting more data than my computer can actually store or handle? What if I'm getting so much data that I can't load this up into memory? So what's the solution to this? It's something we've all heard of, right? You need a database to put your data in. I always thought this was an obvious thing, but I, I also probably set up databases every day of my life. And it, wasn't, it just wasn't part of uh, Linda's day-to-day -day experience. So there are a lot of databases today. If you do a web search, you'll hear a lot. I've heard about several new ones while I was here at the conference. And there's a question, which one should I use? And the, really, the answer is it doesn't matter. The one you should use is the one that you can put data into and get set up and get working with as soon as possible. You can change this later on if you build your application correctly. So for, for Linda and I, she wanted to actually be able to do some fuzzy searching stuff on this. We chose Elasticsearch. Um, I convinced her that it was the right choice because of the fuzzy searching, but really I liked it because Elasticsearch automatically persists dictionary-like objects really easy, and it meant I only had to write one line of code to, to get us to the next step. So before, where we had that line that said print the open graph data, we just replace that with this. Uh, there's a little bit of configuration for, for uh, Elasticsearch, but really this was the big, the big uh, change in our architecture. So now Linda can run as many of these robots as she wants, uh, as long as the Elasticsearch database is running and dump this data in there. And she can search on that data set while these robots are still running. So that is a huge win. She's totally satisfied. And she's ready to go home and start playing with what we built. But there's still another problem, right? Which is, how fast can you type URLs in? And it's probably pretty fast, but it's not as fast as a computer can do it. So what we need is something to get URLs for us. Well, it just so happens, we're downloading HTML pages, right, to get this open graph data. Every single time we download that, we've got a whole new resource of URLs. Uh, anchor tags that we can scrape out and search those as well. So now she doesn't have to type in as many URLs. We can keep looking for new data, new open graph data as we go. So our second robot, very simple, um, just calls. It, it just takes this URL, downloads the data, finds the links, and then uses those links to open up a new process to call the original robot. And this 
works great, right? Now, look at all these things. Look at all these robots. This is great. Like now this is starting to feel like an army of robots. And they're just cranking away and cranking away until eventually your computer isn't going to be able to continue to do this forever. It just isn't going to. You can't just keep on making new processes uh, at, an, at a rate like that. So I presented this challenge to Linda. I said, how do we do that? And she said, well, what if we just took these URLs and we'll put them in a file that we can read out of? And I said, oh, you want to have all of your robots write to a file to read later on? And she remembered that that didn't work so well before. And so I said, what's the solution? She said, well, how about a database? And that's a good idea. We can write these things into a database and then read them efficiently. That's a good idea. But how do I know when one robot's already working on a URL and another robot comes along, I don't want two robots or three robots or all of my robots working on the same URL at the same time. And you might say, well, yeah, I could write to the database and say I'm working on it. But really, as fast as computers work, the chances that one robot is going to pick that up and start working before the next robot realizes that somebody else is working on it, very high. So we need something different uh, to solve this problem. And so that's when, by the way, this slide should have been there the whole time I was just talking. Sorry about that. We need a task queue. You'll also hear things like message queues or job queues. All fine, all ways of solving this particular problem. But the idea is you find a piece of work that needs to get done, and you put it in one end. And then from the other end, the robots can pick these things up and process them. And that way, each job gets one chance to be worked on. If it fails, you can pop it back in the other end or come up with some other failure handling strategy. But this is how we can structure it. So for us, moving fast, we picked um, RQ. RQ is a really lightweight queue management system. It, it uses Redis, which is just another kind of database uh, to store the, the queue states. Um, and RQ is really easy to work with. That, that name equals main part we were talking about earlier, instead of having it just pipe through all these URLs, instead we replaced it with this, which opens up this queue and just starts working, which means nothing until you actually add stuff to the queue. So in order to add something to the queue, you just pass in the function and whatever parameters it's going to need to work on. So now we have this architecture set up. Linda can put stuff in the queue. The robots can put stuff in the queue. They keep working. They keep cranking. Data gets in the database. She can come back later and do her searches. And she can run a whole lot of robots and gather a lot of data a lot, of data a lot faster than she was able to do manually. And the great thing is, is that she can now leave, right? She can walk away from this process because each of these robots is continuing to find more URLs and put them into the queue. So this process keeps on working. More data continues to be gathered. So now what? We have a working system, something that Linda, by the way, is very, very satisfied with at this point. She's ready to turn on her laptop and walk away from it and let it gather up these URLs. But really, what happens when your computer turns off? What happens when the battery dies on your laptop? What happens to all of this data what, that you've been processing? Fortunately, the database is going to store that data, so you'll be able to still use that. But you stop working. You stop processing. And how much work can one computer actually do, especially Linda's? She has a little old laptop that she got from work. So, we need more power than what one computer can do. By the way, this is the first Star Trek reference I've seen at the whole conference. I'm really disappointed. <laughs> so I thought I was among my peers here. So we need to use the word I hate more than anything ever, the cloud, right? Which is just a really fancy way of saying the internet. Uh, but when you say the cloud, it means something special to people in marketing departments. So you have to use this word uh, if you want to get your project approved. So, so yeah, so we're going to use the cloud. And we have already identified there are three services that we're going to need, right? So the first service we need is a database. And we've already decided we're going to use Elasticsearch. Now, Linda's setting this up. This is a side project. So she's not building it in-house inside of her, her company that she works for. But fortunately, 
the cloud delivers. There are so many of these Elasticsearch hosted website solutions. So we picked Cubox.io. Now, I just want to make everyone understand, I'm not endorsing any of the companies that I'm putting up here, with the exception of the one that I work for. I am just uh, giving you some options. So if you're trying to set something like this up, you know that uh, somebody else has used this successfully, and it'll work for you too. So Cubox gives you 35 bucks to get started up. Uh, that sounded really good to Linda, so we set up our Elasticsearch on Cubox. The next thing we needed was a task queue. Now, you don't actually need special software to run the RQ portion of this. You just need a Redis database somewhere. And redis to go who has the least uh, screenshotable website ever, uh, they're really cheap and easy to get started with as well. So we have a Redis database in the cloud. We have our Elasticsearch in the cloud. The last service that we haven't really thought of as a service until now is compute. We need something to run our little robots and make them continue to run while we're not watching. So she had a low budget, and we were running out of time. We wanted to do this by the end of the afternoon. We chose Heroku. Heroku is a uh, platform as a service system that you can put little units of work into and it'll just keep on working. A lot of people use it for web applications. I like to use it as a bunch of uh, little clustered data processors. So there are three steps to setting up a Heroku application since we hadn't talked about setting up a compute service before. Uh, step one, create an application. Step two, git pull the application. And step three, Add a requirement to a text file, add a proc file, commit your changes, and get push your application. Three steps. <laughs> really simple. The last one's a little stretch. But. So this is what a requirements.txt looks like. For anybody who hasn't seen one, this is a standard Python requirements.txt. Heroku is going to read through that and install those packages for you in your, in your machine. Uh, the proc file just says, give me a name and tell me what you want me to run for that name. And that's all we really wanted the proc file to do. And then we deploy by committing our changes that we just made, the proc file and whatever, and we push it up. It's running now. Once we push that up, it's running. I was looking for, by the way, for an image of a bunch of these little tiny dogs running, because these are little robots, but this is the best I could find. So it's running. We need more power now. How do we expand? How do we get the cloud to deliver? Well, Heroku is really easy. You just do this, and now we've got 20 workers running our application. So now, here we are at a Starbucks in Boston, which is a very controversial place to be because Dunkin' Donuts is the right place to sit and do this in Boston. But we're, we're at Starbucks, and we have this running. We just started on this when we were having lunch uh, earlier on. And she's really psyched about this because now she can scale this up. This cluster of 20 robots costs her about a dollar an hour to run, plus the cost of Elasticsearch, which she's got for free for about a month, and, and Redis to go, which she's paying, I think, seven bucks a month for. So, oh wait, I forgot the most important part of this. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now it's, I mean, now it's official. This is real. Yeah, we've legitimized the whole thing. So, now she can build this thing, she can deploy it, she can set these things off to go gather up data from all over the web. She's satisfied, we finally end the, end the conversation, um, and, and that's it. I was really amazed that she wasn't aware that she could have done this herself, because it really took us, I think, a total of maybe three hours to set this up and get it running. Um, but then I was kind of glad when I started thinking about this too, because we have to think about this responsibly. We are all members of the internet community, right? And this sounds really generic and, and uh, something like artsy or whatever, but it, it's, it's actually true. We all live our lives in a way that's connected to the internet, and it's important that the internet stays a safe place. And rule number one when you build a system like this is do not denial of service attack your neighbor. Right? It's really easy. So imagine that first cluster, or that cluster that we have of 20 uh, workers running, right? And it finds, somewhere along the line, somebody's like retail shop that's running on a, on a shared hosted PHP server. Um, it's their business. You know, they're, they're very happy. And now all of a sudden it doesn't work because there's 20 requests happening all at one time trying to gouge out data from their website. So 
You need to think about this before you turn something like this on. How are you going to prevent somebody's website from becoming overwhelmed? Uh, there are some really easy strategies, right? Like put some delays on each iteration maybe. Uh, there are more sophisticated strategies with maybe blacklist and whitelist of URLs. And if you'd like to talk about more sophisticated and cool strategies, uh, talk to me after this talk. Uh, this, by the way, is the reason why I ended up not posting my working code on GitHub because somebody pointed out to me that if they started with a set of URLs that were somebody they didn't like, they would have just built a denial of service machine and they wouldn't have had to do any work for it. Uh, the next rule is that this thing was a web crawler. Now, yours might not be a web crawler, right? We can apply these same principles to something that isn't the internet. You could build these workers that are out probing humidity sensors in a factory somewhere, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the internet. But if you are on the internet, there's this thing called robots.txt, and web developers everywhere know what this is, but uh, other people might not. Robots.txt is a file that you can place at the root of your domain, and it has rules. It says, this is the parts of my site that I allow robots to crawl. These are the parts I don't want you to crawl. You should obey these rules, or you will probably find your robot being banned on that domain. Uh, the last rule, I, now I hope this rule is something that everyone applies universally in their life, but I understand not all of us can, and that's fine too. But in this case, please, think about what you're doing when you're running this much power at one time, when you're making this much network uh, bandwidth happen at one time, think about who's going to be affected and consider that even though, yes, you can turn this thing on and slurp all that data down as quickly as possible, when you do that, you're using bandwidth that somebody else isn't going to be able to use. So like, let's say you are in a dormitory or something like that and setting up a little internal cluster. And you're using up all the bandwidth and now nobody can use BitTorrent or play Xbox. It's probably going to tick some people off. Uh, so now that we've talked about some responsibility, let's talk about some of the gotchas that you're going to face when you set something like this up. Most of these gotchas are web uh, related. So number one is large files. As your thing is crawling along, if it grabs a, happens to find a URL to a 20 gigabyte uh, web uh, movie or something like that, your robot might just download that. So pay attention to things like the content type, right? Like that is one of the headers in that file. That'll tell you what the content is supposed to be. Um, that helps, but also set a limit. Maybe create a buffer that says, like, after I've consumed this much data, bail, give up, because I don't actually want to use up all of my RAM. Next thing is, I just said, look at the content type, but don't trust it, because I can create a content type that's completely invalid for any file, right? It's up to me. I own the web server. So just because it says it's HTML, don't trust that it is HTML. But if it says it's not HTML, it's probably safe to pass on it in this case. And then recursive URLs, this is a tricky one. So one website that points back to another website that points back to one website that points back to another website. Uh, this happens, this is a real thing, and you're going to hit it. And it's gonna, you're not, you might not even see it, depending on how your logging is set up. And it's not, I'm trying to think of a, of a better word to use than what I was about to use, because I got really angry when I hit this one the first time years ago. It's not that people are out there trying to stop your web crawler from working, but people are out there trying to stop your web crawler from working. And even though you can take this URL and put it in a log and say, like, OK, I've hit this URL. I don't want to hit it again, it's very trivial for somebody to just set like a query string parameter or something that now changes the URL. And so you're seeing it as a new URL, but it's really not. And you're going back and forth. You'll hear terms of, for this thing called a honeypot. Uh, you know, for people who are trying to set these things up, it's a death trap because it can consume all of your robots. And now you're spending a dollar an hour hitting the same URLs over and over again. Um, so the data is out there. My talk is, is coming close to an end here. Um, go get it responsibly, please. Uh, so. That's the end of my talk, really. Uh, before you guys get up and go, again, my name is Freedom Doomlau. I am going to be releasing something related to this talk on GitHub uh, in the next week or so, once I have it vetted by some people who will help me make sure that I'm not deploying a, a DOS machine uh, for everyone to use. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter at API Guy or check out, or just follow me on uh, GitHub, you'll see when that comes up. 
Uh, I work for Zephyr, one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, we're currently running a challenge right now where if you can describe a, an HTML file that comes off of the end of the URL in 140, your code needs to be less than 140 characters. It needs to fit inside of a tweet. Uh, you could win an iPad mini. We're also hosting an event tonight, which is uh, in the Zen Garden. There'll be drinks and food and stuff like that. And we are definitely hiring. So anybody have questions? Yes. Just a sure. The code needs to fit in the tweet. That's the challenge. Oh. And we do have some working solutions. We have some creative solutions. I think the first submission, uh, what it output was it would just take the URL, and then it would output the URL is insecure in IE. And <laughs> that is a valid description of that URL. I'm absolutely, of any URL I pass in there. So uh, that was pretty clever. Um, We've had some other creative ones as well. So I'm, I'm interested to see what people come up with because when you put a weird constraint like size on it, um, now we've, Python is the ideal language, um, but you know, I think we'll probably look at submissions in other languages as well. Yeah. <laughs> so any other questions? Great, well, thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing the rest of you at the rest of the conference.